Good to be back with you guys. Uh, we kind of told you we kicked off our summer series that um, I was going to go away for a couple of weeks. You know, kids have summer break and stuff, and my preaching schedule gets pretty intense right through the summer. So kind of snuck away, did some time with the family, had an absolute blast, and you guys were blessed uh, while I was away. I watched uh, those, those times, and yeah. Kevin, uh, fantastic job handling his text. One of the more creative sermon intros I'd ever heard. And uh, I thought, boy, it just illustrated a great point uh, of where he was going. And then last week, I'd bragged a little bit, maybe even set a little bit of a high bar for my dear friend, but um, Derek can preach. What do you know? That is a real deal moment. And he ministered to me. I actually had a guy with me uh, who's just a great dude and has a Greek Orthodox faith. And we sat there and we watched Derek's message together. And he just, wow, this was just so unbelievable. So two great weeks of preaching and and playing off of what Derek uh, led us into last week. We're stepping into chapter 12 as we move through the rest of 2 Corinthians over what will be the next five weeks. And so Derek just led us through this unbelievable passage where Paul is really setting up the continued humility. And what he's doing is he's continuing to refute these super apostles and he comes into all of these qualifications. We're gonna handle some of the tail end of those qualifications this week. Paul's gonna do two things over the next two weeks. And originally, week, this week and next was supposed to be one sermon, verses one through 10. And I got into my prep time and was like, there's just no way. Like, I mean, as much as everyone would love to hear me preach an 85 minute sermon, uh, that's not what we were gonna do. And so we broke it into two parts. And I've kind of entitled this, The Economy of Humility. Uh, And this week we're gonna look at something really tender and precious to Paul in what he shares his heart today. And then next week, we're gonna go into the classic text on humility where Paul really presses in to this idea of the thorn in his side. And this is a text that everybody goes to and we all talk about. So I'm excited to come back and really break that down next week. And that'll be the journey. And so the heart and the journey are the two things we're going to do over these next two weeks. And so as we dive in, let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we come into the tail end of this study of 2 Corinthians. And my prayer is just that you will continue to minister to our hearts through your unbelievable word. So today, as we look at something precious, um, something big that Paul had experienced in his life that he shares with the beloved Corinthian church, we just pray, Lord, would you open our hearts, our minds to what it is that you want to minister to each of us. We're all in different places. And so, Holy Spirit, I trust you to take what, what has been prepared here and to minister to each and every person. We love you. We say this in your name. Amen. All right, let's take a look. Here is our passage. All right. First six verses of chapter 12. Uh, I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weakness. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. Super fun to read, really complicated wording, but that's how the Greek translates sometimes. And uh, this passage, when you look at it, has some really wonky parts. Some of you already are like, what's he going to do with the third heaven? So I'll I'll walk you through it to the best of my ability. But this first verse really comes out of what Derek did last week, where he says, I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I'll go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. What Paul has been doing through this whole section is continuing to hold this straddle And it's a really tricky one because remember, Paul has some adversaries that have been coming into the church and they're doing things that are culturally sound within the Greco-Roman world, but they are absolutely ridiculous when it comes to the ministry, the kingdom-minded ministry of Jesus. And you'll hear this phrase a couple of times today, the kingdom of Jesus is upside down. And we'll talk about that. Hey, you want to be, you want to be loved? Go be a servant. You want to feel completely free? Go be a slave. And yet the world has no time for that. And neither do Paul's opponents. They want glory, fame. They want to come in. They want to preach their sermons. They want to get paid and they want to leave. So what Paul's doing is like, listen, Corinthian church, you are way too obsessed with credentials. You are over the moon. And and that was a literal thing. 
Like these super apostles, these teachers would come in and they would have credentials. They would have letters of recommendation. Paul's referenced that earlier in our second Corinthians letter. Hey, listen, why are you asking me for letters of recommendation? We have a history. We're family. And he's literally saying at this point, listen, you guys are so obsessed with the credentials, with the things that you think matter. So in some ways, he's like, this is the only way to get your attention while at the same time, and here's the straddle, I've got to figure out how to let you know how useless this is in regards to what God's actually doing in our lives. So Paul's demonstrating this unbelievable humility in the midst of an obligation to do something that like he says here in verse one, it's futile. This has absolutely no value. But if you wanna play the game, I can play it better than most. Really great verse on this, and this is kind of the classic Paul boasting text is this. You go to Philippians and it's three verses four through seven. And this is where he really goes deep and kind of blows everybody out of the water. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Let's see what that means. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Paul's setting something up here that nobody could really hold a candle to. As he goes through these things, you look at it and he goes, listen, circumcised on the eighth day, check. That was what was required. He did it the right way. He says that he is of the people of Israel. He was not adopted in. He did not grow up in a pagan culture and then became Jewish. No, no, no. I was born into it. It is familial. It is a legacy. It is generational for me. From there, of the tribe of Benjamin. Do you guys know who came from the tribe of Benjamin? Saul, the very first king of Israel. What was Paul's name before he was Paul? Saul. So he comes from the tribe of the first king of Israel and is named after the first king of Israel. Goes from there, a Hebrew of Hebrews, again, a reference to his heritage, his generational line, as to the law, a Pharisee. What he's saying is, I achieved almost the highest ranking position you can. And most scholars will tell you, Paul was likely trending based on his training and his background to be a high priest type level. From there, as to zeal, like you wanna talk about taking your faith serious, I was persecuting the very church that I'm now a part of. I took it so serious, I took it to death. And then finally he comes in and says, righteousness under the law, blameless. I followed the law and all of its little add-ons perfectly. Paul's sitting here and telling him, look, you guys wanna go toe to toe about this. It's what Derek taught us, it's what Kevin went into. He goes, I can do all of the credentials, but what? It's, it's stupid, it's futile. There's no reason for us to do this because it doesn't help advance the kingdom. But if you wanna do this, that's fine. And now in the final place where he's gonna boast, even though he hates it, holding that straddle, he goes, let's go to something that I bet none of the other guys can do. Let's go on to this. Let me tell you about revelations. Let me tell you about some time I've spent face to face with the creator in the midst of the presence of God because I'm gonna bet that none of those guys can do that because I've had visions and revelations that go way beyond what they've experienced. Let's check uh, verse two on. It says, I know that man who for 14 years ago was caught up to that third heaven, goes on to call it paradise, and then comes back and says, he heard things that cannot be uttered. Now, 14 years ago, okay, for those of us who've spent some time in the scriptures, you know that Paul had some time after his conversion and I wanna clarify something because it's super easy when you hear 14 years you go, oh, that's probably about the time of the Damascus Road experience. There's a differentiation here. Paul got himself wrecked on the Damascus Road, then went away for three years, came back, spent some time in Jerusalem and then had a 14 year gap. So what he's talking about here is a separate circumstance from his Damascus Road experience, which is super important because when you talk about this, you've got to know it's something different than what happened there. Now, right away you're going, hold on, Rustin. Paul's not saying I, he's saying, I know a man. Remember Paul's whole model here is that he's continuing to hold a humility. So like, again, a lot of study on this one and I'll tie it together in a second for you. But what the commentators will tell you, what scholars will tell you is as part of his humility, Paul is using illusion to elude to something that he did, but continue to remain humble. The Corinthian church knows Paul's story. So 
they haven't necessarily heard what he's about to share, but they're like, all right, this kind of checks out. And then take a look at this because this is where it really ties together. This is next week. I'm going to steal a little bit of my own thunder because we only go to verse six this week. But take a look at verse seven, okay? Paul's going to connect because he's saying, listen, I'm, I'm having, I want to go on to visions and revelations. That's his topic. That's what he's covering. So in verse seven, which we don't get to today, this is what he says. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of what? The revelations. And then he goes on to our classic text. A thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Paul connects him to the revelations. And that's why, even though he's being humble and a little bit cryptic in the way he's describing it, this is Paul talking about his own life. And so if we miss that, none of this will make sense. But what I love here is this, and, and we're going to tie this in to what we're doing in our walk today, because Paul still holds a really profound humility, even in what he is sure he experienced. So the phrase that I love is, is the one, <clears throat> excuse me, where he goes, listen, I don't know whether this was in the body or out of the body. He says it twice. And we're going to talk about the connection between the reiteration there in just a minute. But Paul covers the exact same statement twice with different verbiage. But he does so where he goes, listen, I don't know whether this was bodily or outside of the body. What would the bodily be? It would be a literal ascension into heaven, which you go, well, that's crazy. That's never happened. It has Genesis 5, Enoch is literally raptured up into heaven. If you follow it through to 2 Kings 2, you have Elijah being ascended into heaven, didn't, never passed away, bodily ascension. And then the same thing, Jesus, which I throw that one in there because everybody's always like, well, it's Jesus. He can do what he wants. And so we have three separate accounts there, all right, all spanning the scriptures of where that could actually happen. And what Paul's saying in this first sentence is, I don't know if it was bodily. And then he comes right back or he says, and I don't know if it was out of the body. You go, well, what would that look like? That would be where a human spirit experiences something while the body remains on earth. So if you go to Acts 10, it's like Peter's trance, right? And Peter's sitting there with something so profound folding out in front of him that it changes the way that he understands the kingdom of God and his requirements as a former Jew in regards to the law. Because he hears from the Lord and he has this unbelievable thing where he goes, oh, I'm not under the law anymore. It has to do with the dietary restrictions experienced within Judaism. And he goes, oh, okay, that would be the closest we have to what Paul's saying here. Maybe it was an out of the body experience. Maybe it was a bodily experience. And I'm not totally convinced which. That humility blows me away. For Paul to, to, to have this thing that happened that was so powerful in his life and still be able to go, hey, I wanna be honest with you. I don't totally know how this took place. And we'll talk just in just a minute about what our lives look like when we have some big, powerful, supernatural experiences and to still leave room for the mystery of God. Paul is sitting in the mystery of how God worked in his life. But one way or the other, <clears throat> what we need to walk through in this is to understand it was that real. Paul leaves no room here for this to be a dream or just something he did while he was asleep. It was so real that he's questioning whether or not he bodily stood in the presence of God in the third heaven or paradise. So let's cover that. This is where it gets like, if you read this passage, this is the type of passage where if you're doing this in a devotional, you're like, all right, let's just move on. This is kind of weird. I don't know what the third heaven means. I'm not sure about paradise. I think it sounds like heaven, but we'll go from there. So paradise, let's cover that phrase first, okay? Greek word, paradisos, okay? It is used three times in the New Testament, and this is super cool. The first one, all right, Luke 23, Jesus is on the cross and he looks at the thief next to him and says, today you'll be with me in paradise, okay? We hear that word, it's famous phrase, Jesus is pardoning the sins of this man as he's hanging there dying for those sins. And Jesus is hanging there on the tree of death, rightly reinstituting the relationship between God and man. Next time you hear it is in our passage today, 2 Corinthians 12, 3. And the last time you hear it is in Revelations 2, 7. Now listen to this. He says, to the one who conquers, again, what Revelation, into the story, this is how it all ends. So you're hearing about what it looks like for the people of the kingdom of God to be in God's presence. And it says, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is where 
which is in the paradise of God. So what it's connecting here, the end of the story is to say, in the paradise of God, we have the tree of life. Now, if you, go to the, if you go all the way back to the Hebrew, which I'm sure all of you would love it if I did, I'm so glad you did, because here's what it says. It connects it to the tree of life in the garden. Pardes is the Hebrew word. So I'm sitting there this week, and I'm talking to my buddy, Ryan Goebel, whose brain just works biblically and theologically in ways that I don't even understand. But we're going back and forth, and, and Ryan connects biblical ideas in some really profound ways. And so we're sitting there, and he goes, so let me get this straight, because we're wrapping back and forth and, and going through this concept. He says, it started in paradise, our word, paradisos. It started in paradise with a tree of life in Genesis. It got corrected with Jesus on a tree of death. And it ends in the Revelation story, where the conquerors are eating from the tree of life in the paradise of God. It's a story about trees. And I'm like, man, the fact that you just read what I read and <laughs> pulled that out of it just blows my mind. But I love when those little things raise to the surface. And one of the things I'm most looking forward to in heaven is to sit before the absolutely inexhaustible knowledge of God and watch him do that same story over and over again for all of eternity. Hey, Jesus, what was the cross about? Was it about this? Yes. And. Oh, it was about that. Yes. And. You see, the beauty of what God does and the brilliance of having a completely ununderstandable God, one who cannot be fully understood but is happy to be known by his people in relationship, is that moments like these and way beyond, because I'll promise you Jesus comes up with better stuff than me and Ryan Goebel sitting in my office on a Tuesday, is this. So the goodness and the greatness of God goes so far beyond our imagination. We see his grace, we see his truth, we see his power going beyond what the human mind can grasp which is why he tells us, hey guys, you can only go so far. My ways, higher than your ways. My thoughts, higher than your thoughts. My mind, yeah, it's different. I work in different ways. So that's the paradise concept. Paul also says third heaven. So you think you had a cool week. I got to study first century cosmology, which was super fun. And I worked all week to make sure I didn't say cosmetology right there. <laughs> and I did it. Because if we just sit up here and I said, hey, let me tell you about first century makeup, that would have been a really <laughs> stupid thing to say. So there's a really integrated practice. When you talk about the first century, you, they had a really integrated understanding of cosmology, meaning they had these layers of heaven. And so for some of us, you're like, you're like third heaven. Like, uh, remind me, Rustin, but like basic Protestant belief, we don't believe in layers of heaven. You go, no, we don't. We're going to stick with our Protestant beliefs. We're not going to go off into anything else here. But what you need to understand is the way that a Greek mind in the first century would have understood that third heaven statement is like this. They remember there's no Apollo 13. They're extrapolating and guessing at what's beyond what they can see, but they know the first heaven would be our atmosphere. So that's what they understood. Hey, it looks like the birds and the clouds, they're kind of closer than what they called the second heaven, which would have been the stars. So they're in this moment where a first century mind glued to earth, there are no airplanes, there is nothing else, looks at it and goes, all right, we can see that first heaven. It's the heavens, we can see the clouds. Second heaven, those stars look a long way away. Let's call that the second heaven. But the third heaven for a first century mind when they understood was the abode of God. So they were, all right, first, second, third, we have the abode of God. And then what you understand here, and this is what Paul's making this point. This is why I've spent a little bit of time on it. Paul is connecting the abode of God to the paradise of the Bible because the abode of God could have been used by a pagan culture to say, yeah, you mean where God is. That was kind of an interchangeable reality. And what Paul's doing here would have spoken to a Gentile mind just as much as it would have spoken to a Jewish mind and could have even been viewed as evangelistic for a pagan mind would have sat there and gone, oh, okay, abode of God. Yeah, sure, right? Where we have the pantheon, where we have all the gods that rest. And what he's doing is going, listen, if you're gonna understand the abode of God, you need to understand it with this paradesos concept and that can go nowhere but the God of the Bible. Paul's making a point to say, I went to be with the God of the Bible. I went to be with Yahweh for a moment. And in that moment, bodily or out of the body, something unbelievable happened. 
And for Paul, the point is very simple, and this is where it gets really personal. But Paul had an experience. He had a moment. And it was something that, by the way, he talked about his Damascus Road experience with everyone. He talked to everybody. Hey, listen, I was blinded on the Damascus Road. I was there. Everybody knew that story. Paul has not spoken about this. We don't have this account anywhere else. And the, re the reality that we're pressing into was this was incredibly personal and it was transformative. It was radically transformative for him. And what he's trying to do is sit back and go, hey guys, I'm speaking about something that happened. It was supernatural. It completely blew my doors off. And it's one of the things that sets me apart from some of the common peddlers of fables and fairy tales that are rolling in and out of the church, basically here to earn money, to orate, and then to leave. They don't care about you. They've not stood face to face in visions and revelations, regardless of what they say. They can't tell you the things that I can tell you. And this was different for him. Take a look at this quote. It does a great job of explaining this. Most people, had they been granted an ecstasy like Paul's, wherein they had actually been raptured to paradise, to God, to his son, to the Holy Spirit, to the souls of the departed, to the discourse of heaven, would scarcely be able to contain themselves. Today, they would write a bestseller, My Rapture, a personal account of my trip to heaven and back. Seminars on five steps to your own rapture would be sold out. The writer's words would be accorded of the status of divine revelation. Why, you could build an entire denomination on it, and even fund a college, rapture you. Paul, however, from the evidence of the text, would certainly have taken this story to his grave, uh, to the grave, were it not for the compelling necessity to boast in it for the sake of the Corinthian church. See, for Paul, this was a risk. And this is where we're gonna start applying this to our lives pretty, pretty heavily right now because some of us, most of us, have had experiences, maybe not necessarily like Paul's, but what Paul is doing, and, and this is, let's, let's make the connection. Here's our application point as we start to move towards our conclusion today. Many of us have had experiences with God and God is supernatural, but we have very natural minds. And our natural minds, particularly in like a post-enlightenment era, and then you got modernity and all the things. Like we are wired to grab on to what we can prove and what we can understand. So when you talk about supernatural things, and again, we just did a spiritual warfare series. You're like, are we, we're talking about a lot of supernatural things. Well, Paul is. Paul is literally saying at this point, I may have very well bodily ascended to heaven. And he's taking a risk because let's be honest, the Corinthians aren't safe. We're going to tie safety into a little bit of our application today. The Corinthians are not safe. They abandon Paul at every turn. <laughs> Anytime somebody shows up who's got a silky voice, they'll just listen to him and buy whatever they're selling. And Paul loves them so much that he's taking this extremely personal, sacred thing that was so intimate and so powerful, he's never shared it with anyone, and he's bringing it out of the bag at great risk to himself and at great benefit to the Corinthians. I want you guys to think about your own lives. I want you to think about times where the Lord has moved in some unbelievably powerful ways. Those times where you may have experienced things. Jamie has talked at some length about some of my experiences with prayer, where the Lord has used other people and, and spoken powerfully into my life, uh, into my life and, and the lives of my family. And I was like, boy, I didn't see that coming. And it was supernatural. I can't explain it. I don't know how strangers knew those things about me, but the Lord used them in powerful moments. Another great example, and I see this one all the time, because again, when you end up being kind of the guy who has had experiences like that, you start to collect people who've had experiences like that. So my office is always the one where somebody has a crazy experience or has a family member who's in really tough shape. They show up and they're like, hey, something happened. I didn't think any of these other people really would understand. They're gonna think I'm crazy. And I'm like, okay, well, grab a seat. Let's see where this goes. <laughs> Some of you, and this is one of the things I just want you to see, this is where our, our natural minds fight the supernatural. How many of you have looked in the Bible and you go, I have the gift of discernment, all right? You can raise your hand, it's okay. Uh, nobody, just nobody, okay. <laughs> Tough room, it's nine o'clock, I get it. But um, I have so many people that come to me and they say, I have the gift of discernment. And I would affirm it. I would say it's the gift of discernment. But here's where the natural mind fights back towards the natural and away from the supernatural. The Bible actually doesn't describe a gift of discernment. The way that it's worded in the Bible is the gift of discerning spirits. Now, everybody was like, I don't want that gift. 
And you may be right, but guess what? You didn't get to choose. So here's what happens. People who have the gift of discerning spirits, it actually doesn't change the functionality of the gift. It changes the experience of the gifted. Meaning, when someone who has the gift of discerning spirits, which is what the Bible calls it, that's not Rustin's definition, that's the Bible's, what they're discerning, and this is the way I would explain it, and this is the way I explain it to them when they show up and they're like, I don't even know what to do with this. They're discerning something spiritual about what's going on in an atmosphere or a person. So they have an ability, it's uncanny. When you have people who have the gift of discerning spirits, they'll look at somebody and go, um, I don't know why, uh, that, something's wrong over there. And you're like standing next to him going, I, what do you mean? And then sure enough, something will come out six months later, eight months later, the person was really hurting and nobody knew. And you go, what were they discerning? They were discerning something spiritual in their spirit and that discernment is how that gift functions. It's supernatural. It's literally something that the Lord has deposited in them with great experience of the kingdom. Here's the other side, and this is kind of what Paul is doing today, and the reason he doesn't want to let everything off the chain. There's also the reality that most people who have the gift of discerning spirits also discern spiritual things. And spiritual things aren't always fun, they're always pleasant. So these are the people who sit in a worship service, and I'll come up, and they are just weeping bawling. And I look around and the rest of the room's like, hey, we're having a good service. But these people continuously get wrecked in worship. And I kind of go, what's going on? Well, they're discerning the spiritual realm at a completely different level than somebody who doesn't have the gift of discerning spirits or discerning spiritual things at that high a level. doesn't mean you're not moved spiritually. It means there's an aptitude or an elevation around this gift. Same thing though, and this is what lands in my office a lot. Hey, Rustin, I don't always see the pleasant stuff. I see the scary stuff. Sometimes I'll see dark things. They'll come in and they'll go, I see the demonic stuff and I wish I didn't. What's wrong with me? The reason it's so important to teach on what the Bible has to say is because those people show up hurting and just like Paul, they're sitting there going, I don't know, bodily, out of the bottle. We serve a supernatural God and we live in a spiritual realm as well as the physical realm. And so when you look at sections like these, Paul is having an experience where he's like, listen guys, don't think I'm crazy. Don't think this is something that's just happening to me. This is how the kingdom of God works. It is a spiritual kingdom and it's laden with all sorts of things, both blessing, the wonderful, the being able to see God do ministry in unbelievable ways. You also get the radar. Once the Lord turns the radar on, and listen, some of you right now are like, why are we talking about this? Because there's some people in this room, probably more than you think, who right now are going, there's a bunch of parts of my life that make a lot of sense. I had absolutely no idea that that's how it functioned, and I have that. And let me tell you, if that's you, and you see and you experience the scary stuff, listen, that's a kingdom gift. The Lord gave it to you because it blesses his church. You don't have to be afraid of it. You can sit back and allow the Lord to continue to work and give you discernment, and that's one of those scary things that Paul sort of says today. And so here's a little bit of where I want us to go because Paul's gonna close this thing down right here, right now with these last couple of verses before we move into next week. He makes this statement. He says he's had a supernatural experience, much like many of us have, in a myriad of different ways. By the way, that gift of discernment, one example. There's a bunch of different ways that the Lord can move powerfully in your life. But he goes on in these last two verses, and this is what he does with them coming out of this big, powerful moment. On behalf of this man, I will boast. And he goes on, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except in my weakness. Guys, this is a setup statement for next week. He's about to take us to the weakness passage, the humility passage. And so he's setting it up and he's getting the Corinthians right on the edge of their seat where he can reel them in. But when he says, on behalf of this man, I will boast, what's he doing? He's going, listen, the reality is, and he's making a distinction here between flesh and between what he's doing in the kingdom. Paul discerns like, hey, listen, if something's not great, it's my flesh. If something's awesome, it's Christ in me. That's that statement where he's sitting there going, look, on, on behalf of the great things that have happened, I won't boast. When I tell you about me and my life, I'm going to tell you about the things I'm not great at. That's what that statement's doing. And he closes it down at the very end. So that what? So that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. This is what I really want us to wrap our heads around. This is a humility section. The whole back half of this book is all about humility. 
And so with the example I just used and Paul's humility statements, what I want to ask today, and this is where all of us kind of need to go because our culture is not training us for something that we're in desperate need of. Do you have safe places to share intimate spiritual experiences in your life? That's what this really comes down to for us because basically this is a setup passage for next week where Paul's about to talk about his weaknesses. But when I read this passage, when I go through it, it boils down to that question. Do you have places where you can talk about the growth? How does growth happen? Well, you find out you're not great in an area. That's why we grow. It didn't work. I'm not doing well. The Lord has more for me. Whatever the motivation is, you need someone in your life who you can sit down with and just very simply go, hey, Lord, um, I need someone. Lord brings them. That person sits down and you get to now sit with them and go, hey, um, I'm struggling. I need more. And I know the Lord will show up, but I need somebody I can journey through this with. What is culture telling all of us? You're good. One of two things, either you're already good and one of the ways culture is doing that is taking things that are actually problems, telling us they're not problems anymore and saying, everybody around you should just be telling you how awesome you are. And then you should be posting about how awesome you are everywhere. Like we just keep inventing social outlets for us to either, and it's getting quicker and quicker. You know what? We're not even gonna make comments anymore. We're just gonna snap these things and slap them up on a website. And you're like, oh, okay, great. It's just pictures. It's just these flash things. There's no content. There's no authenticity. We can make it look like whatever we want. And then we're shocked when people show up with a beautiful life on the socials. And then they sit back and they're like, oh, guess what? I have an addiction. I have a divorce. I have a kid that's wayward. My life is falling apart. You just wonder if they had safe places to come in and to go, I'm actually a mess. My life is nothing like what it looks like on this exterior facade. And I'm in desperate need of someone to tell me that they'll love me while the Lord grows me. And then when that season's over, you need somebody who you can kind of celebrate with. Hey, the Lord brought me through a season. We're getting ready to start another one. And oh my gosh, I, I, I want to celebrate this. And that person's there and goes, I remember where we were six, eight, 10, 12 months ago, 24 months ago, 10 years ago. I remember where you were. And now the Lord has done this unbelievable thing. Do we have people, safe places where we can sorrow, where we can celebrate? Places where you can take powerful and intimate experiences with God. Things like what Paul's describing. We have too many stories that we put up on my stories, too many places, even testimonies this morning and baptisms at every single one of our campuses where you're hearing someone say, and God moved in a way I never saw coming. God did something that was so outside of the natural, it could only be described as the supernatural. Do you have places where you can sit down and say, without you thinking I'm crazy, can I tell you about what God did that went so far beyond what the world could have produced? Because gang, if we don't have places like that, we're dying on the vine, we're drying up. We have to have places where we can outlet that. Hey, I need growth. Hey, I've had growth and I wanna celebrate this with someone. People who have eyes on us to be able to share some of those things because we all need to share the depths of our spiritual journey in those places because if we don't, in some ways, we start to forget them. It's the great people in our lives who've journeyed with us where they actually are the ones that look at us and go, hold on, you're falling apart right now and you're telling me that this and this and this are true. Do you remember where you were five years ago? I have people who do this in my life. I'll get down and they'll look at me and they'll just go, hey bud, can we remember where you were a decade ago? 14 years ago, 15, 20 years ago? The Lord's doing stuff. Can you just be patient while he continues to do stuff? Each and every one of us need that. Paul took a great risk because he's in leadership. It's like one of my favorite, I've said this before, one of my favorite ministry books to pastors is called Sheep Bite. He's like, yeah, you want a shepherd, you're gonna get bit. That's just part of it. When you talk about leaders, you're watching Paul take some bites from the Corinthian church. But to those of us who are just living in the church on a daily basis, the message we're getting from this passage is simply Paul going, you need places to do this. You need to be able to walk through life with those who will love and care for you. And they'll do the sorrow and they'll do the celebration. 
And they won't look at you like you're completely crazy when you share something supernatural that the Lord has done. It's a great setup for next week where Paul's going to talk about, again, some supernatural things with this thorn and his pleading with the Lord. I can't wait to come back and share it with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for what it is that you're doing in all of our lives, places where we can come together, where we can find community, we can find safe places uh, to sit and to share the things that you're doing in our lives. Some of the earthly things that are going on, our circumstances that need to be both sorrowed and celebrated, as well as some of those supernatural things like what Paul shared today where he goes, this was just nuts and I can't totally describe what happened. And people who are willing to just sit in the mystery of what it is that you're doing in our lives. Lord, we rest with you. We love you. We just ask that you would continue to minister to our hearts as we walk forward. We pray this in your name. Amen.